Happy Monday, everybody. Happy Monday. So, yeah. J Justin, just just give me a, just a taste, just a little snippet. The 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 Watchman appreciation meter farther farther in the the maybe there's something here. Are you optimistic or pessimistic? Where are you at? I, should I subscribe to HBO? My my amount of skepticism can be evidenced by what uh, Lori pulls out of her case in her hotel room. Uh, that's how much that's how much skepticism I have with where this show is going. Okay, a, a comically a large, large amount of skepticism. I think is what you're saying. girthy, <laughs> spherical <laughs> skepticism. That is what I have toward this show. Three episodes in. The screw on testicles was an interesting. <laughs> let me let me let me just say that I eat good dialogue for breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I thought I. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> yeah I, I mean, again, I'm going to wait until apparently episode six, everything makes sense. Everything's amazing. That, and episode that, six, that's what everybody this says. This was the first episode I'm, where, I'm we, gonna, get, gonna, where we got to. I mean, this is the first episode where we got to see the original, some of the original characters and stuff. It's the first one that they that they spelled out and directly set up that uh, that that's Ozymandias and. Uh, I don't know. I, I, I was I'm thinking glad it. we took three episodes to do it. Glad that, you know, that's. Again, look, I, there's, there's a lot of stuff that I can say, but I'm going to, out of respect to the fact that all the reviews I read before, and I knew what I was getting going in, that they said that everything was going to twist and resolve in about mid season. So, and I have friends like you who I did not watch the leftovers, but they're like, Hey, this isn't your lost era Lindelof. All these things will pay off in cool and interesting ways because apparently they did on The Leftovers, which I haven't seen. So I am out of respect, out of knowledge to those reviews and respect to my friends. I, I am not going to issue more than a herm on this show. <laughs> Except to Andrew. I do I will, like... Uh, I will secretly do, take gigantic craps on the show via text. But uh, other than that, that is my only outlet. Justin <laughs> Marks is the showrunner, or was the showrunner for Counterpart. And uh, I love his sentiment. He says, all love to that one person who's never read Watchmen, but is trying to follow the brilliant HBO series. I know you're out there, and I salute you. It's impossible. Like, it's it, impossible. It, it, it's how much nonsense it's does impossible. everything look like? <laughs> It's impossible. I mean, that's the other thing is Ashley's watching it with me and, and she just can like she skipped the middle episode. She had no clue. I mean, like she had no less clue what the hell was going on because there's so much there and it's layered on top of it with all these mystery boxes of, uh, of you know, other things that they've built into the new world. I, in in. Uh, at risk of cutting this conversation short, we are uh, we're we're running a little late to get, to get started. Yeah, let's go. Up. Let's get it. Let's, let's get the show started. All right, uh, everybody let's ready? Go. All right, feeling it. All right, then uh, Andrew, take it away. In three, two. Hello and welcome to the Weird Things Podcast. I'm Andrew Maine, joined by Brian Brushwood. I'm sorry, let me take off my Damon Lindelof number one fan hat. I'm just going to sit it right over here. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. You're intimate. You're, what are you doing? That's right. Come at me. At yeah. me. Go ahead. Twitter.com slash Wood. <laughs> Justin Robert Young. Send him an email. He loves emails. He gets back to him. <laughs> uh, Mr. Bryce Castillo. Hey, everybody. That's me. Hi. And we have a special guest today. We've had him on before on After Things, and this is Mr. Brian Thomas Schmidt, who is uh, – Brian has been an editor, a writer of science fiction fantasy for a number of years. Brian was one of the editors – worked on the, the Martian. Recently, he did the Predator uh, anthology series, If It Bleeds. And right now, he has the book out, Simon Says, which is a sci-fi thriller. Hey, look Brian, at that. You have a copy. Awesome. <laughs> of course I would need a copy. Of course I support my friends, you know. You know, if Schwed ever wrote a book, I'll order 10. Man, I am right. so good at starting books. I have so many ideas. Dude, that's how it starts. <laughs> so you should write a Watchmen book. No, yeah. I'm just kidding. Anyway. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, um, Mr. Uh, Brian Thomas Schmidt, it's great that you're here because, uh, you know, you know what this is, this month is? November. <laughs> November nineteen, November twenty thousand nineteen, November two thousand nineteen, 
Blade Runner is real. This is when Blade that's Runner right. took place. Oh, yes, that's right. I was reading about the things we don't have and the things we do. I, I want my flying car. Uh, yeah. I've come close. I've ridden in Andrew's Tesla, but uh, yeah. I haven't quite gotten to a flying car yet. No, nah, well, you know, thankfully it didn't fly. Um, so kind of cool. It's 2019, and you know, we don't have the 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 complete urban decay. I mean, unless you live, you know, where Justin does, or you know, close to some of the areas near me. Uh, yeah. You know? By the way, uh, trust me, I wish that uh, uh, that those areas had the available street food that they have in Blade Runner. That would be <laughs> that would be a tremendous upgrade. And for the record, uh, man, is, if I had to choose I between my replicant. That's if I had to choose between replicants and cell phones, I'd rather live in the world with cell phones because how do you have replicants but no cell phones? <laughs> you remember they had expensive pay phones with like crappy Skype images, you know. Uh, it is it is that was a remarkable movie back in the day. The the vision of the future felt like a very real lived in kind of future and it's incredible. And you it know, when you write it, it it was also, uh, and I'm I'm pinching all of this from articles I've read before, but it was also one of the first uh, kind of uh, libertarian representations of the future. You know, in a world before Snow Crash, uh, you had these um, these beautifully architected worlds, your 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 Star Trek utopias, where everything was centrally planned. But then uh, that was my first depiction of just an utterly chaotic mishmash of different cultures that I thought uh, I, I, I'm kind of thrilled that that's eventually what the internet became is like you're constantly bumping into all kinds of different not only not only nationalistic cultures or racial cultures but also social structures of, of you know these little sub meme cultures and, and well, the except, other thing about it is for the whole non-judicial murder of people who you just consider non-humans are actually human now wait a minute though Wait, so so what if Blade Runner did not maybe fully accurately predict our real world? But I like where Brian's going. What if it absolutely predicted the internet? Because we have everything there. We have replicants. We have, uh, uh, you know, artificial uh, creatures that have their own kind of a uh, uh, will, at least on some level. We have botnets that uh, uh, certainly affect our lives in certain kind of ways. We have people that hunt after them and track them. We have biases against them. They affect our culture and politics, like there is. Holy cow, I think you're blowing my mind. Well, you're, you're, you're a hundred percent right because we do. It's like, it's like, what's funny is I'm feeling my own biases. I'm like, yeah, man, destroy all them bots. They don't get to vote. They don't even get to talk. Shut, sh kill them all. The unique thing that I liked a lot about Blade Runner at the time and even more as I look back is, you know, we had so many depictions of the future that were very idealistic. This was a kind of a depressing, dark vision of the future it wasn't all hopeful, and everything wasn't necessarily going to work out great. You know, I mean, even with the heroes, they weren't necessarily, they might fix a problem, but they weren't, you know, hey, we saved the day, and now the world will be a better place. It wasn't It wasn't that kind of story, which I think actually, you know, is a lot more like the world is right now for us than we probably want to admit. And, you know, I think that uh, matches modern sentiment more than, than it did at the time. Well, there, you know, there, it did come out of sort of this trend on um, late 60s on 70s on forward the, the dystopian sort of future you know because you sure. look back at Soylent Green a lot of stuff where it's harder actually to find a positive view of the future you go to like 2001 which was you know you had you know the Soviet and America tensions and stuff but still the sort of explorative theory sort of thing but I, I certainly loved it because of visual I like that you know they got like Sid Mead and just these great visual artists on it but you know it's interesting so I think what I like about it is everybody sees it and can kind of have a different take from Blade Runner because like well, I remember as a kid watching this, and at first I'm like, they're robots, and then I'm like, oh no, they're people. They're because they they have genes, they have all this stuff. I'm like, oh my god, this is about racism because, you know, they're not robot. They use the term robot, but a way to sort of de you know dehumanize them, and that was my takeaway. But it, it certainly is this, just as valid, I guess, anybody else watching it. So well, I was I was I contrasted with, for example, you know, there was Battlestar Galactica, there was Buck Rogers. Mm -hmm. was, uh, Star Wars, all of which, in my opinion, were a lot more idealistic views of the future in some ways because of the way the heroes were, you know, succeeding. Mm -hmm. Blade Runner, I mean, you didn't really get the sense that Deckard was just doing his job. And, yeah. you know, he was fighting against pretty bad odds, but there was no winner in the sense of, you know, Luke Skywalker blew up the Death Star or anything like that. You know, mm -hmm. or, there was no sense that. Uh, the world was going to be better afterwards. Whereas when, you know, Star Wars and some of those others tended to have kind of that 
we're gonna, you know, they're gonna try and Hopeful. get the world better kind of theme, you know. Well, because I think, and this is we we often talk about this with the Marvel movies that the Marvel movies are really good because they're not superhero movies. They are about superheroes, but many of them take stories and elements of other kinds of movies. So they are war movies. They are heist movies. They are all these different sort of uh, genres. And ultimately, what I think makes Blade Runner a classic is that it's a whodunit. It, it, it is a detective story. Very much. It is a noir. This, yeah. yeah, very much in this kind of Maltese Falcon-esque thing that by the end of it, you know, if you look at some of those those great detective stories, when you unravel or a movie like Chinatown or something like that, the end of it isn't a pot of gold. It's like when you chase exactly. after a very human secret, you find out there's something very screwed up at the end of it. And then when you finally pull back that curtain, you're like, oh, God, yeah, makes a lot of sense that you kept that secret. That's awful. Like, I'm glad. Exactly. That and that's what I mean by the darker sense of it that, I, that, I, that contrasted to me what else I was seeing at the time. So, I mean, back in the 80s, you know. So. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So let's go. Uh, what's one thing from Blade Runner you wish we had? Oh, uh, another car. thirty years of Edward James Olmos. Yeah, I was, I was literally <laughs> going to say like uh, Edward James Olmos's weird accent. That's I, I really wish I had that. Uh, I mean, it is remarkable know. how many things just seem dumb. Like uh, I, I remember even as a kid thinking that the lady walking around with the clear umbrella with a fluorescent tube handle, like, well, that's the <laughs> dumbest thing ever. And here we live in a world where not only, I mean, that would be totally unremarkable. Yeah. <laughs> and the world of selfie sticks, we've had to reassess everything that's dumb. Like, wait, congratulations. <laughs> yeah. We actually live in that world. <laughs> Yeah, and Bryce it, just found on Amazon the Blade Runner style glow uh, LED style umbrella, and it's only thirty five bucks. And oh my god! Yeah, and and uh, yeah, uh, amazing. And and they can get there by the end of the week. Uh, uh, that you can have to it's great. Is there free Prime shipping? Because that's important. You know, that's a, that's a terrible. Thing. No. You know, I'll, I'll throw the one of the th things that was casually mentioned in there, but was a thing that was throughout there was they kept talking about like going off world and off world and the idea that. L.A. and this part of the Earth had sort of become just sort of like, like you know, like, like some dirty old sort of place where people sort of were left behind, where everybody else went off to the frontiers. And as they brought this up in Blade Runner 2049, where, you know, you you understand that actually out there among the stars is where the cool stuff is and the gleaming cities and the modern sort of world is. And I like the idea of like, well, what's what's the rest of the universe like or what's the rest of this like? Well, and that's that is another one of those elements of, uh, of 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 those noir stories is that you know only really rich people would even do the train trips from you know uh, uh, New York to Chicago or Los Angeles or even or San Francisco, right? That, that these are uh, uh, you know even if you lived in the big city, it's so fascinating to see how different we think of a big city in our modern world compared to even how we thought of it in. The 70s, where, well, it, where it was a thing that was decaying as opposed to like, yeah, let's come here now because this is where all the bustle is. But but a, a big city was also representative of being plugged into your community. Like you couldn't be a mover and shaker and not be in a big city. The idea of being in rural nowhere and being able to, to shape worlds around you wasn't possible in a pre-internet era. And now all of a sudden your physical location doesn't matter at all. What matters is your virtual real estate. Like uh, uh, increasingly, and maybe this is more of an after things topic, but I think about like the properties that we're building on YouTube as as being physical real estate that, that have value. People buy and sell those channels and they generate so much traffic. And uh, I, I, I don't know, I, I'm back to your metaphor, Justin, of, of Blade Runner is alive and well and right on time in November 2019, just not in the physical space that we thought it would be. Let me throw out a story that's sort of uh, uh, kind of interesting. And we've talked about this a little before. One of the growing problems in Japan right now is Japan has a population where 20% of its population is aged 70 and older. Birth rate's been declining. And so... I think they're at or they're below replacement value. So basically they're not replacing. And a lot of times people are like, oh, it's a great goal. I'm like, maybe, but the problem is, is everybody gets older and there's not young people to take care of the older people. 
and you end up one of the problems that one of these unforeseen consequences empty houses everywhere that's a big problem with japan is they have these ghost houses which are houses are just left abandoned nobody wants to take ownership of them other family members don't because of the taxation etc and you know the houses start to get under disrepair and etc and so you know and that's that's kind of something that will start happening elsewhere too you well, know because as other populations start and, to and age on, out on top of that like we talked about when the boston dynamics uh, subjects before i mean that's why that's part of why people are looking at buying these uh, caretaking robots to to walk around mm-hmm. and help you out with all of these things uh, yeah yeah you know i, I think the, the the population thing is is fascinating in japan and and part of it is also tied to some the decisions they've made about naturalization and and immigration which they're very uh stringent on but uh you know i don't know they they don't uh, uh they're a very careful culture i've noticed by watching terrace house and i state confidently <laughs> yeah yeah well and i guess it's it's a point to say it's just it's going to spread to elsewhere. You know, this is going to be a global phenomenon, you know, if, if we, you know, don't have a higher placement value. Um, and, you know, and yeah, to the idea of, you know, technology to sort of assist as we become an older population, we just had Google buying Fitbit. And that's because you look at Apple and the Apple Watch and how that's become a really growing, you know, service and brand for them. And the idea of like having that personal device that first starts as health, but then it becomes a medical device. And as you get older, you know, it becomes more attractive. Yeah, I've got complicated feelings. I've got... uh, Oh, go ahead. uh, Go ahead, go ahead, Brian. Oh, I was going to say, I have complicated feelings about uh, Google buying Fitbit because, of course, uh, as, as, as people know, I am an unrepentant lover of my my uh, pebble time steel that I still wear to this very day, day with my original Kickstarter backed edition. Uh, it, it continues to be the best in terms of battery life and simplicity of notifications and all that stuff. And uh, I, I had hoped that when Fitbit bought pebble, we would start to see sort of a, a pebble 2.0, but it seems like they're not going in the directions I was hoping they were. But now all of a sudden I feel this very visceral reaction at the idea of Google, these, these merchants of all my, private most data that that uh, you know selling it to the higher highest bidder or whatever uh i was hopeful that at some point fitbit would have an awesome pebble 2.0 uh but now i don't even know like i i have i have ethical quandaries about buying anything from google that's gonna that's gonna have all of my health data on it i i think i think there was a big question on whether or not this was more of a hardware play or more of a data play for for google and uh, when you hear reportedly that Facebook was also very much in on this, uh, and and not to say that uh, Google and and Facebook don't do hardware, they certainly do, and specifically, you know, most recently Andrew can attest to the fact that Facebook put out maybe a best in class VR experience that that uh, has has a, a great following to it. But uh, I'm I'm with you, Brian. I, I think that there is a a very interesting Rubicon that we have crossed, where now the average consumer. Uh, is thinking about this kind of stuff, is thinking about micro-targeting, is thinking about how ads serve to them. And both Facebook and Google are unrepentant ad sales company. And keep, keep me, in mind, oh, th- th- well, this is not an exaggeration to say that they will have business plans that involve, hey, uh, we're if somebody has this watch, we will know when they finish their meal. And we, uh, per our marketing research has shown that this is when they will be the most fatigued. This is when they have the least amount of resistance to uh, marketing messages. And we will intentionally display those ads at that exact moment with the intention of, of getting you better return on investment. And we're gonna do it without well, any kind of expectation that, or, or, or care about whether it's a good idea or a bad one. See, and that to me is not, that far from the, the the blaring billboards in your face and in Blade Runner's vision of the future, actually. Yeah. I mean, I think I think we're 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 already there. What it concerns me more about Google or Facebook or anybody owning health data is forget HIPAA law. I mean, your health data is going to be out there, and we've already had problems with companies, you know, firing people, retiring them early, doing things because they found out retiring them early, like Blade Runner. <laughs> Finding yep. out that, you know, finding out about, you know, health problems that they're like, oh, we don't want, you know, we don't want liability or we don't want to pay for the insurance, these kind of things. I mean, you know, Google and Facebook who sell their information to the highest bidder, that's a serious concern that we should all have about our health data. The privacy I, of it is going to go away. 
I I I think all this is valid, and I you know I'm usually the guy that's like ah oh, Google this, Facebook and the data and all this. I will give you an alternative, more benevolent sort of thing though to think about is because I. Brian, you're the second person 24 hours to mention to me who was a used was an owner owned one of these products that's now owned by Fitbit, who's now says I don't think I want to make the jump to Google, but a big part of the revenue may be from the services side and the idea that we will sell you this device and then for five bucks a month, six bucks a month, we're going to sell you the health services or whatever. Because I think that's where a big part of where they're trying to grow into is it. I think they're kind of close to being is squeezing a lot of ad dollars out of they can to get available advertisers. I mean, there'll always be ways to improve on that, but a next big sector of growth that they're all looking at is everybody's launching services. And I could see that I think Fitbit launched, like they had like a subscription service now and you go look at their website and you see they're trying to sell plans to health companies and stuff. So I think it's more a services play than a data play, but that doesn't rule out that it's also going to be a huge data play. Well, and keep in mind also, let's say even if they did want to roll out a service that you would subscribe to, Google has some rehabbing to do on their reputation when it comes to protecting individuals' data. Uh, you could you could roll your eyes exactly. when Apple at least says that hey, we understand your privacy is is tantamount is is paramount to us. That's why we charge so much for our hardware. We want to protect your privacy, uh, but at least they're even saying it. Whereas Google, yeah. not so much. Well, also it's or like Facebook. I mean, Google and Facebook both have problems with with privacy. Big problems. Well, the, the 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 difference between those three companies is that if you go to Google and you say, hey, can I buy something that involves micro targeted data? They've got Plenty of ways for you to do it. Same with Facebook. If you go to Apple and say, hey, how can I pay you money to trade on the data? There's there's not that similar. Now, maybe going forward, they they loosen that, but they used to have an ad sales company. They, they'd since uh, kind of depreciated it, and that's the direction that they feel that they want to go in, is they want to be the way, company. By the way, full disclosure, ads. keep in mind, I'm a total hypocrite on this. Like, like we have Facebook pixels on scam stuff. Uh, we've occasionally run targeted ads uh, through Facebook to, to try to reach, you know, our customers who over the last six months have done it. I mean, there, there's a reason that all of these are best practices uh, in, in the world well, of business, but that doesn't make me feel any less weird about the whole thing. And but, also it's like, yeah, there's there's no for anybody who's like, oh, get rid of micro targeting ads. Like that's really what people want. Twitter, that's really what people want. Facebook, it's like that's th that's the product. That's what they do. There is no them without that. Like they yeah. like right. have ability. Like and, and also they solved a problem. They solved a problem in the marketplace. Display ads were inherently unreliable and untrackable. And so what they their big pitch was, look, we can sell you data based on that now i do think that it's not inconceivable to me that there's another shoe to drop specifically considering how fast and loose facebook has been with their analytics on on other things that maybe those numbers aren't what they seem seem to be but make no mistake these companies do not exist and there i do think that there is a realm in our world where you can say hey did you previously visit this site maybe you would like to buy this thing that seems to me a little less creepy than some of the more advanced uh, versions of this. And here's the interesting thing that, that I came across actually in writing Simon Says. You know, I was doing a lot of ride-alongs with police because it's a, it's a detective story set in 2029. And so I was looking at a lot of technology. And some of the technology I made up for the book is actually real now for the police, ironically. So I, one of the things that I asked them about a lot was, you know, and I'm thinking also of the TV show Person of Interest, which kind of explored this theme, but how much data and how, how do they balance respecting people's privacy with getting the information, you know, for modern law enforcement? Because it, it's a real problem between all the cameras that are all over the streets and traffic cams and everything that record all kinds of data to their databases, you know, they're all connected into with the, the National Criminal Information, you know, computer system at the FBI to any number of other things, how much, you know, how do you balance privacy law with doing police work? And it's complicated and there aren't really good answers for that. We're gonna, yeah. I mean, the more this data gets out there, the more an issue is how much the, you're going to be compromised by just the fact that people know way too much about you and what you're doing. Yeah. I, I want to ask you about your world building, but let's first, uh, 
you know, there will be no weird things. There will be no weird things in the world without your support. Absolutely, Andrew. And that's why you need to head on over to patreon.com slash weird things. That's where you can support this show. Kick us a few dollars and we will deliver for you each and every week right here on twitch.tv slash Night Attack live and in your podcast feeds. If you become a patron right now, then you're going to get our After Things podcast where we talk about the business of being a creative and an entrepreneur before anybody else. And if that's lesson number one, if you want to be a creative entrepreneur, get the information you need before anyone else. And you can do it at patreon.com slash weird things. Thanks to everybody who supports us. Speaking of target ads, no, I'm just kidding. Anyway. <laughs> so, so Mr. Uh, Mr. Schmidt, let's talk about you. You in writing a book that's set ten years in the future, you have to make certain choices about f- world building, whatnot, what that future is going to be like. How did you did you decide to go for what you think is going to be, or what suits your story? What was your strategy? Uh, I kind of I kind of got a mix of both. For example, the the device that's real now that I was talking about a minute ago that I kind of thought I was making up was one of the guys told me, one of the cops said, oh, one of the gags that I play on uh, on certain crooks is I, I put their thumbprint on my cell phone and tell them I'm getting their fingerprint and I'm, I'm running it right now. It scares the hell out of them, right? <laughs> well, now they can actually do that, okay? Yeah. So I created a system in my book I call Prince, P-R-I-N-T-Z, where basically the cops were able to do that. Well, now it's real. Uh, it's not quite at the cell phone level. They actually have to have a special fingerprint reader that they bring out to the scene but they can literally get fingerprints on the spot and it's you know so a lot of the technology that i'm talking about is technology that either they have or they're on the verge of the cop the cops often talk to me about what's coming and what's going to be going and what they'd like to have and i put a lot of that in it too to try to envision you know because you know in in modern crime fighting you know the biggest battle is to stay ahead of the crooks So whatever technology, you know, the crooks have, they got to be a step ahead. So they're always trying to come up with new technology. It's kind of like it's just as much of a race as like, you know, the laptop that you're using that from a year ago is already out of date. I mean, it's just that that kind of tech race where they're always coming up with the new stuff. And then how do they, you know, afford it and get it in the hands of officers and who needs it? All those kind of things. So I, I used all of that in my thinking about the future. Yeah, that's that's been you, you see in law enforcement, you see some of the technology they have was something that was requisitioned like 10 years ago. And by the time it makes it into offices and cars and stuff, we're like, man, is, is that a, you know, is that a, a Pentium 2? You know, this is, seems <laughs> yeah. a little bit slow. And like, and like well, you know, well, yeah, like mobile fingerprint scanners. And, you, and sometimes you get the big versions of the stuff. And those have been around for about a decade. But, you know, the idea of getting down to the small portable one, and that is. That's what they, that's where it does get scary is that the things that we take for granted in the hands of law enforcement, you know, which could be well, useful. Well, it has so. to be, I mean, it has to be, it, they have to police themselves. They have to monitor it carefully. And there are very good programs for that, in, yeah. in, at least in the KCPD, which is who I worked with on this Kansas City Police Department. I mean, I'm sure there are departments that don't have that. And certainly some of the smaller towns where they don't have all the infrastructure don't. But, you know, this is a state run department. Kansas City Police Department is the only department in the state of Missouri that's actually owned by the state they 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 don't they don't they're not responsible to the city they're responsible mm-hmm. to the state it's a weird setup but it was set up years ago so you know there's a lot of um things that they get and also controls that come into play because they're part of the state rather than a city so the state is like you know complying with a lot of you know concerns and issues that, that, that the city may not be at yet so it's it's I mean, I'm always trying to think of cool things that we can come up with that are, you know, fun, while at the same time I'm paying a lot of attention, doing a lot of paying attention to what, what's developing in the city, what are they what are they about to do, what are they trying to do, what do people want to see that, you know, I can kind of just extrapolate that's that's happening and all of the, and trends and all those kind of things. It's complicated. But I spent, mm. you know, I spent four to six years four or six years ago, this book was done four years ago and I revised it again before I put it out. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, I've had a long period of time to work on this. Well, that's it. I would say that one thing now is I brought up at the beginning, we're talking about, Hey, this is the age of Blade Runner. To me, it's like the age of the future. And, and Brian pointed out, like, you know, you see a thing in there, like this weird techno gadget, nothing will surprise us now. 
you know, like literally it'd be really hard to sort of, you'd have to like fast them like, you know, a real on anti-gravity or teleportation or kind of the things that would surprise me just about anything else now. Like, I don't know. You know, we watch videos of like what, you know, there's been faked videos that look like Boston Dynamics robots, you know, like, you know, firing guns and stuff. And you realize it's CGI, but we're like, yeah, but you could have an anthropomorphic, anthropomorphic robot firing a gun right now. And we wouldn't be like, that can't happen. And so, you know, we are kind of in this age of the future. Man, Bryce is good. Wait, Bryce those, is... Are, those are CGI? Yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. I never <laughs> heard that. See? Uh, I'll tell you what's I wild. Gun, I thought their gun safety was ridiculously irresponsible, though. Yeah. So I wondered about it because I was yeah. like, man, their gun safety. These people are idiots. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll tell you what's wild for me to consider is the idea that there are crimes that don't yet exist that I'm certain will be created. Stuff like, uh, for example, the intentional gaslighting of someone with the intent to radicalize them into taking violent action. I don't mm -hmm. believe that is a crime just yet, but I don't see any reason that it wouldn't become a crime in the next 10 years. If you could make a case like, yeah, you manufactured these 375 uh, uh, deep fake videos that told a false narrative that created this false reality around someone and then placed them in a situation to, to make this very poor decision and causing this, this level of either economic harm or physical harm uh, man, that's pretty wild. I hadn't even considered having to invent new crimes. Well, well, so it's not that hard to disenfranchise people these days. You've got the doxing thing going on. You've got swatting going on. And but like, like do doxing whole... is a weird one because that's the reverse of like it used to be. There, there was no such thing as doxing because that uh, because there was the white pages. It's like, yeah, of course, I have an address. I have a phone number. Here's how to reach me if you want to get a hold of me. And now all of a sudden, it's a crime to do the service that, that used to be you well, know, thrown I, on your doorstep. Well, that's what you need yeah. to broaden. When we talk about doxing, you got to kind of broaden to say that there's, there is the, yes, you can find it, but versus like what you talked about when somebody wants, when somebody says, here's Brian's address, everybody, it would be a shame if people went outside of us. And I'd say that's the big difference, which yeah. is still not a crime, but you know, right. the, the intent. I, so I, I, in I your, your, that they're singling people out for reasons that are, are, you know, we don't like you because you did this or you believe this different than us and, and trying to publicly humiliate them, trying to cause them a lot of suffering and, and difficulty that can disenfranchise people, make them angry and lead to the kind of thing you're talking about. That's already a step in that direction is all I'm saying. And so, I think that, you know, you're going to the next level with this whole fake video thing and all that kind of stuff. And I think it's coming. People are pe my point is the intent to do that is very strong right now. It's already yeah. out there. Yeah, so Mr. Schwood, in your scenario, at what point would free speech laws prevent that from being in crime or be changed or what? And like one of the things I love about our country is we don't have laws about hate about hate speech. And the reason I love that is because a problem when you have a hate speech law, somebody gets to decide what that is, and that's when these things break. And I'm like, yeah, I'm all for hate speech if I get to decide what it is. And it's like, well, no, no, no. So, you know, will, would that be a limit against that or will we work our way around it? Well, and I, I think similar to uh, the hate speech conundrum is you have uh, ultimately it's like, does somebody knowingly uh, falsify someone else's perception of reality? And of course, then that, you know, you, you have to show intent in, in that case. Yeah. So well, I think, in other words, at, I don't have an answer about, for you, but that, that is a sticky one. The thing Not about the hate speech thing, sure. though, is it's really important to understand that the different the, where the where the boundary really is is saying whatever you want to say no matter how nasty or distasteful it might be to other people that's still free we are protecting that when you call for harm or do something with that speech that causes people to actually be harmed or encourages people to do harm then it becomes a crime then it's a whole different thing well so sure yeah but that's but talking that's, about that's, race or you're talking about you know sexual orientation in a way and saying these people are awful and I wish they'd all die. That's horrible, but it's not a crime when you're saying in the out, US. find your neighbor who is like this and kill them. That's a different thing. Well, yeah, yeah but, that, but that, but that is that, 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 that's as old as shouting fire in a theater, right? Like, like there, there have always been limitations on free speech when it comes to uh, a directing or sure, but the complication is that, you shout fire in a theater, only the people in the theater hear it. Now the theater is the entire world because we have the internet, and yeah. it's instant. So I mean that complicated. Yeah. Well, and, and oh, now, 
well, we, now we get into the, the, the really squirrely area. Like uh, over in Europe, they have the legislation, the, the right to be forgotten legislation that says basically if somebody Googles your name, you, you, you don't deserve to be defined by what one mob said about you about one tweet uh, at, at that one time. And, and that's one that I really go back and forth on because on the one hand, I think it's insane. It's like, no, if you said a thing, you, it's a fact that you said the thing and it's not on Google to hide that from the world. But on the other hand, uh, human beings are human beings and sometimes stuff gets misrepresented and, and, and it would be a bummer. You know, you're, you're Justine Sackos of the world who, who made one comment and then that's just going to be the definition of them for the rest of their professional life. And, uh, and I guess at this point we're veering dangerously close into the whole discussion about cancel culture. But the, there is a discussion that needs to be had. Like, is there uh, – some people say, oh, what's the big deal? They're just losing their job. They'll go get another job. But on another level, at a human level, uh, for, as tribal beings – uh, exile equals death, and for someone to try to orchestrate a mob to exile someone from a community and to place upon them a, a, a black mark that will follow them forever to where they can never work in their same field again, they're just, their reputation is destroyed, it well, does feel like something well, tangible happened to them. Raise your hand if you've never said anything stupid in your younger days. Oh, well, yeah. <laughs> I will not okay. admit to anything. My, my problem with it is this. My problem with it is this. There's not a one of us who hasn't said something stupid that they regretted or something that they've changed their mind about 10 years, 15 years ago. If we're I, able to just arbitrarily go back and find anything objectionable now that somebody said in the context of 15 years ago and ruin people's lives, there's a problem with that. Well, there's, but there's a lot of things that fall into that category. Yeah, but I, I my my issue with the right to be forgotten is that I, I can understand sort of the humane reasons we want that because you you, you take like Justin Sacco as a person, you made one flippant sort of content, you know, comment that all of a sudden and then then you had a media group in part with group we, we could talk about. Those people, when they now get to want to play victim, but they did a, a, a malicious thing to this per the outsize to that. But the other, pro my problem with it is like, hey, if I had a habit of being shoplifting and got arrested a few times, and there were articles written about this, and I'm like, hey, I want those things pulled because I'm a new person so, now. So what well, you're saying is, you you think there should no. be kind of a social credit system to kind of you know preserve well, your reputation? Well, I, I, well Brian, I, there is a difference between a government enforced social credit system versus the idea that if if I if somebody call if somebody says if I'm upset that somebody ripped off an employee ripped off from me or stole from me whatever should I be able to write a blog post about it and talk about this experience? We'd say, uh, sure. But if you then get into a system where you're saying, no, we need you to pull that now. And I'm like, well, now you're policing well, my speech. You know, I have, you know, that's, that's, there's uh, a difference between the, a pattern of a behavior. You're talking about a pattern of crime that somebody committed. That's one thing. Somebody making one isolated con comment 15 years ago. If you find them making that comment over several you know, years, even more recently, that's similar. That's proof that this is who they are as opposed to well, who they were. Well, either either, either way is. Either way, is my my point is I don't think we should be in the business of trying to if some you know the the post the thing or whatever somebody expressing a point of view on somebody else that may be negative or be positive I think we all have that right to say that and when we try to say no we're going to make these things disappear from the internet that bothers me because where is the line where does it stop you know if I and, and because it's it's I have free once you start stepping down it's free my free speech is to write articles to have a newspaper and talk about this stuff and if I want to index and make this available to me it's like yeah I, I I it may be unfair or uncool that other people that stuff is out there. But that's the way it works. I mean, I don't want to live in a world where we start trying to, you know, erase memories. Well, having been through some online crap like this, let me just tell you, I'm not I've never tried to erase anything I've said. But I certainly think that people ought to do a little bit more due diligence of finding out who you are now as opposed to who you were then, because people yeah. change. I'm a sure. way different person than I am 10 years ago when I heard sci-fi or 15 years ago. I'm a way different person. I have yeah. different beliefs. My a lot of things have changed. I've learned a lot in life too. So I, I think, think that well, the problem is people are taking an isolated thing out of context, yeah. saying this is who somebody is, and it's not necessarily a fair representation of, of what they might say now. Yeah, I agree. I, and I think I think we're eventually going to accumulate enough crap about all. God knows if somebody wanted to go through our podcast, which will soon be indexable in Google and all that. You know, the the the, the real Andrew Maine is going to be very apparent and out there. And you know, well, you know, I'll be like, no, I'm I'm a new guy and. 
it, we're all gonna have enough stuff out there. I think eventually, oh, we're not gonna get it's, out. Right. It's over. It's over. For, we're for, gonna listen to your podcast on our Fitbit oh, now. You know, that's that's a. <laughs> I've I've always said that it's not it's not a it's not a uh, an if it's it's a when. Yeah, uh, it, is. it is. As we all continue to move along, that like especially considering the nature of the kind of entertainment that I've treasured in my youth and I tried to build a career making like plenty of landmines that I've stepped in that I would not step in now, largely because I learned that lesson of like, Oh, that wasn't funny or that I didn't feel good Mm -hmm. after that. And, uh, uh, man, yeah, it's the only hope I have is that by that point there is, there is at least an understanding of, Oh wait, we've seen this movie a lot. We've seen hero gets, uh, 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 puffed up, uh, uh, moment is revealed. We can now predict it, like, uh, and and there's a playbook on how to handle it. Uh, by the time that it it comes for us all. Well, <laughs> hell, is... you you already had to go to surgery and get a new foot because you blew it up in the landmine. So I mean, there's something to be said for that too. Sure. Uh, <laughs> it it is interesting. I I heard somebody. I, I want to say it was a, maybe on Sam Harris's podcast suggesting that you know there's really we're in the middle of a of a podcasting boom, and it was suggested that maybe part of the reason podcasts are so popular right now is specifically because everybody has become so guarded in what they say in social media because it's just a landmine uh, a minefield as you you know wade into various you know identity politics and what have you but meanwhile in a podcast at least in order to hear those words you have to wade 45 minutes in before you get to those interesting topics and uh, uh, Bryce as a matter of fact has pulled up uh, uh, some upcoming news that I wonder if if that'll shape the world of podcasts. Yeah, so there's a, a new thing in Apple Podcasts now where uh, they, for selected podcasts, probably that's probably like a size gate, they will actually do some amount of transcription of your episodes. And so I've seen I've seen where other big podcasts have made a bit out of like searching through Apple Podcasts for like bits or you know, phrases like the turtle that cries like a man and their podcast shows up at top and it's the episode that it's from, uh, you know, the, the, this searching and, and transcription stuff will is, is becoming very cheap and, that, and getting very good. I just realized that means that, that we're on the cusp of what, 10 years ago, it was a big deal. Everybody, uh, not everybody, a lot of, a lot of mid-level celebrities were creating Google alerts for their own names because somebody would write a little article or a snippet or mention in a comments or whatever. And then all of a sudden that, that famous person would swoop in now for good or for ill, you'll be able to do that with podcasts with, to, to find out if anybody casually mentions your name or your podcast. Yeah. Google's been doing this since earlier this year, and that's what I was talking about before. Their program is, is they're going to build this out, and basically, uh, because that's the new, it's that what, where's this data they don't quite have access to? Podcasts have been opaque, and now by doing the transcriptions and mentions, and then, you know, doing their own metrics, like yeah, it's gonna, it's all out there, guys. Every one of your episodes of Night Attack, everything like this, all of it's gonna be out there. We're gonna get the dirt on you. It's gonna, it's gonna age I mean, real it, well. It, it, it's been there forever, right? You know, uh, I think. It's been there forever, but it, we live in a culture now where a porter just pulls up your Twitter to try to see the dumb thing you said. Oh, and 100%. So you're gonna do I mean, just it's, Robert it's, Young podcast and then look up the word Albanian. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, 100%. And, and this has always been the laziest form of journalism ever. The, the, if there's one black mark on this decade as we round it out, uh, uh, in terms of its its contributions to journalism, much of which is very, very important and we should pay attention to, is the something happened on TV. And now I'm going to get a blog post by going on Twitter and searching awful words and then finding out whether or not some Yahoo on a totally unregulated social media site indeed said a bad, said an awful, horrifying phrase uh, uh, while something important was happening on television. Like, well, it, other- is, it is no effort, it is lazy, and it is highlighting just the worst element of humanity for nothing but cheap clicks. The other problematic element of it is the idea that your triggers are my responsibility. I mean, that's a, that's a debate we're going to have to have, and that's problematic, too. I can't walk around and know what your tri- triggers are if I don't know you. So if you're going to be offended by something I say, it's really more on you than me to a degree to learn how to deal with that. Going around and getting offended by anybody and everybody who says something that doesn't even know you. I mean, there are there are minefields you walk in you don't even know is a minefield. And most people wouldn't even think was a minefield. That's that's 
also part of the problem. Do, do you think it's possible that we can see positive nudges from your Googles or your Apples or whatever that uh, nowadays we're able to have conversations, full on conversations back and forth uh, through translation engines where maybe it doesn't translate everything exactly perfectly, but we're at least able to come to an understanding between two parties not speaking the same language. Uh, do you think that there could be a plug-in that sort of, you know, somebody says something, uh, this engine has, has detected that this may be an incendiary phrase to you. Uh, hover over it to get a context on it and what this person, his background is and, and what he likely meant if it was phrased differently. Do, do, you, do you think there's any hope for that kind of thing to happen? Oh, absolutely. I think that's where we're going. Look, I was just thinking about the fact that people are dictating whole novels with Dragon software. And OCR, which 10 years ago was part of my job and was not very good, but look at what it can do now. They're going to just be running those podcasts eventually through like a dragon type software. It'll do all the transcription for it. They won't have to have a person sitting in a room doing any of it. And it will, you know, eventually they'll make it so that it doesn't get that much wrong. Right now it'd get a lot of things wrong and humans have to correct it or you just have to live with the errors being in there. And, and I think you're going to absolutely get to the point where you literally can have like Google prompts that, 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 that go through and, 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 and give you cross references of the, the text that's you know, subtitled on the screen as you speak it. And, so my, and how much of that is really helpful? I don't know. So my, yeah, my question is, you know, that was sort of the whole hypertext dream was the idea that within a document, you could find out more and dig more and get nuance and all that. But uh, how many people really want that or just want to be offended? Uh, well, 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 and part that, of that is how, how much do you want to actually have to, Spend that much time censoring yourself so you can't even speak, speak, be who you are. You are. I, mean, I, I wouldn't right. mind if everybody spent much more time censoring themselves. That seems to be like a universally good thing. If we all took a little bit of time, and as a matter of fact, I, I would. And, and again, I'm not talking about clamping down on free speech. Uh, just nudges, you know, like, uh, like Twitter saying, "Hey, man, it looks like you fired off three tweets all in a row." In general, more people than you would expect end up regretting that. Are you absolutely certain you want to continue to engage in this behavior? Check yes. No, or or right, hey, well, we noticed I mean, that these words. Being thoughtful, being yeah, thoughtful like, is uh, one thing. Being thoughtful is important. Automatically having to check every word that comes out of your mouth before you say it, and changing what you're going to say, and changing your voice in effect. That's what I'm worried about. Well, I I, I look. Uh, there is a language, speech, communication is constantly evolving. There's no reason sure. that. You should assume that that is not being uh, that's not happening at a more accelerated pace. The more that we're able to communicate with each other, and we now we do have a tremendous clash of cultures. Not only uh, internationally, obviously, it's probably the, the 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 broadest way that we can look at it, but also uh, regionally. We live in a very very uh, expansive uh, country uh, that has many different subcultures within it. That now all of a sudden all operate on this very jumbled mismatch of of a. Uh, what we assume to be a level playing field. That being said, generationally, generationally too. Don't forget uh, of course, yeah, that as well. You that know, I. Said, oh, sorry, please, sorry, sir. No, 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 no. I, 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 I. Uh, 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 that being said, I, I do think that there is a, a, a way that we will be able to guide ourselves going forward, if even just to re-silo. You know, I think that the, the thing about social media that was amazing was that. For the first time, a very lonely space on the internet. I go to the same me message boards. I talk to the same people. I go to the same websites. There's a limited cross section between uh, the people that I interact with in my actual daily life with the people that are on these sites. Uh, now all of a sudden hit a tipping point where we were all able to do it. And now there was a cross uh, current of everybody being able to speak to each other and the fact that, oh, uh, did you hear Brad was canceled on Twitter? Now actually pays that now that actually has currency in your real life because people know what those things are. And we have a, a crumbling ad infrastructure for media that then incentivizes them to hunt for whatever clicks there are. And that plugs into social media and we get a dovetail. So I, I hope that there is I've always clung to this and, and this might be my last dying words as I'm uh, uh, burned in the ashes of, uh, of you know, my, I, I flutter away in the ashes after Pompeii happens. But I do think that we are in an adolescent era and there will be 
at least some level beyond the chaos. And I hope that we are getting closer to there <laughs> and not continuing to uh, flee into our Blade Runner future. I imagine like the first person who figured out like writing wrote on the stick onto the ground and sketched it out. And, you know, Justin comes along. What is it? Oh, it's just Justin smells like poo. Ah, why would you do this? <laughs> you know, like, oh, I'm going to write something out. I'm getting a stick and I'm writing things too now. And somebody's like, we got to take away sticks, guys. This is causing problems. I, yeah, but I could totally see just like the guy who defuses beefs that you have with somebody who you just met, and then maybe he's friends with both of you. He's like, he's like, hey, hold on, I know the guy didn't come across well. He misspoke. Look, you guys both like the Mets. You both like this. You, you know, whatever. Like, like, and then you're like, okay, you provisionally uh, decide to to let it go. Uh, I, I think I would trust an AI with that. Like some, like, hey, I've gone back. This person uh, 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 culturally identifies very similar to you. You have an 85% crossover. For whatever reason, it seems like he uh, spoke poorly on this. And that, uh, as your AI advisor, probably not worth it to 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 to, to twist nipples over this one thing. But instead, <laughs> you know, like it, 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 yeah, you guys both like Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. So, <laughs> then, so, so I, you have a I, chance I, to give back to civility. I like this idealistic idea. I do. But like, I remember when I realized, you know, I was an atheist and got, I mean, a, and I got involved with atheist groups. I'd be sitting there and be like, yeah, we need to do something about Christmas. I'm upset when I walk into a store and I hear about Christmas and I'm like, I, I like Christmas, you know? And like, and then like, well, this this holiday display here about Christmas. I'm like, ah, it's cool. This is great. And I'm like, and there I'm like, ah, it's angry. It's upsetting to me. And I'm like, and now I don't know. They it was like they wanted to be upset. And I don't I don't know how that AI fits in there. If people don't because like I'm like I, I believe the same stuff you guys do. But like, holy cow, like you want to be offended. And well, you know, I, I I there's also I, the guy. There's also the people who it's always been a problem with technology or free speech bull who refuse to use it responsibly. There's yeah. always going to be the people that are just like, screw it. I'm going to say whatever the hell I want, and I love pissing people off, and I love causing conflict. And it, no, no matter what AI they get, they'll like, oh, so I shouldn't yeah. say that? That's exactly what I'm going to say. I mean, that's just, you're all, and, and, and we have to, at a certain point, identify who those people are and react differently to them than we do to other people, I think, in a sense. I mean, if we're going to get away from the chaos. You know, uh, why well, I want Brian's AI companion. I would use that. that but he, all right, so here's I'm I'm with you, Brian. But I do think that there is an evolutionary shift that kind of has to happen for us societally, and this is what it is: the tech platform side will never save us. We're never going to have Facebook or Twitter or or anything else be able to algorithmically change how our behavior is. They're never every every moment that they try to mold it in a certain direction, uh, uh, it will, we will always find a way to get exactly what we want out of that platform, whether or not they want us to do that exact thing. Where exactly. I do think we could have a, a future is on more of the personal side. If we are looking at, hey, you wanna know what? Maybe I'm gonna spend a, 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 a larger amount of money on a personal AI that is now mine, and it doesn't transmit to anybody, and it's effectively as secure as my inner monologue, and it is just trying to make me better, and I trust it, and I want it to be my personal trainer. I want it to be my life coach. I want right. it to be these things that I am already gonna go out and pay money for. That's where I think that we can have a future. And I do think that part of this is also, we got to have a more responsible understanding of what these things are. And I don't think that our generation ever functionally will because it's still magic. It's still this thing that popped up when we were either in our, our uh, uh, adulthood, childhood, or teenage years. And uh, uh, we will always have this, this different uh, reaction to it. And I've never felt more on the other end of a generational divide. Last night, Ashley and I were watching, of all things, TikTok. And TikTok will automatically just feed you the popular things that are happening right now. One out of every three is just a teenager confessing how sad they are, right? Just saying, hey, I like this boy. This boy doesn't like me back. Hey, I, I'm stupid and I didn't study for a test and I'm, I feel like my father doesn't like me, right? And some of them are funny. Some of them are just out and out confessionals. But I was startled by the idea of like, man, 
When I was a kid, I had to internalize that and just draw skulls repeatedly on my notebook cover until somebody <laughs> noticed that I was depressed. Like they just, they get rewarded. It is, it is well, part I of mean, cultural currency to say, I'm sad. I'm very sad right now. And I don't like how my body looks and I'm uh, sad about my scoliosis. And I'm like, that's the most healthy thing that I have ever seen uh, in, in my entire life that we're, that we're rewarding. Enough people are liking it that it's being fed algorithmically to me, a 35 year old, uh, as they're saying, this is obviously the most popular content on the platform. It gave me m the most hope I'd ever had for, for the youth of our world. Well, and the reality is that, 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 you know, people just because it's available doesn't mean people are going to opt to use it. And so the technology in its coolness and our excitement over it is always going to outpace the sense of how it's appropriate to use it, how it's responsible to use it, and so on and so forth, and any appropriate regulations that might be put on it. I mean, we're always going to have those periods where it, it comes along and all of a sudden it's become, you know, it's creating problems that we never anticipated. That's just I like. It we yelled at we yelled at Facebook because ah you guys should be censoring some of this stuff and then they hired people to watch videos and they're like ah why are you making people watch those videos they're horrific and they're being traumatized by this I'm like ah, I don't oh you're, you're, you're talking about for the for the uh, uh, the what do they call it uh, the standard quality standards or whatever yeah the, standards. Exactly. Except for the violence or whatever I mean people are there's there's all these stories that are out about the you know factories of underpaid workers that are having to monitor all this Facebook content. I'm I I, I, I a day who have PTSD and all these problems. Because... I met I met somebody, a friend of a friend, was a contractor for YouTube, and her job literally every day was just to mow through the flagged content, and among them it, that is the worst of the worst, right? So she's just watching. Imagine the worst thing that could be posted on the internet. That and then times three, because the people that are posting it have been thinking about this for a very long time and they are hunting for it and they are doing awful things and they are spreading it. Uh, it is it's awful. Right. But then at the same time, you have to uh, uh, because you need to protect these standards and practices. That's before we even get to, oh, this is politically objectionable. This is uh, uh, a bullying. This is any of the like, you know, balls and strikes. Maybe we should have this on the platform. Maybe we shouldn't. This is just straight out beheading videos and, and worse. Yeah. All right. We can go to worse or we go to better, but let's go to picks. Yeah. Dude, we'll go to better. Uh, in fact, a lot of what we've been talking about sort of touched on in the new Malcolm Gladwell book, uh, Talking, Talking with Strangers, I believe it's called. Uh, really enjoyed it. I just finished it this morning. Uh, he, I, I love... First of all, the content is is good as Malcolm Gladwell, but also uh, talking to strangers. That's the name of it. Uh, he also makes it a little bit closer to a podcast. He at the beginning of the audiobook says, "Hey, normally in an audiobook, uh, somebody's just reading everything to you. In this case, whenever there's a quote and we have the original audio, I'm just going to play the uh, original audio for you. So it'll be a little bit more like an enhanced podcast, uh, which I enjoyed quite a bit. Um, it, mm. it, it's it doesn't have." a terribly strong thesis the way some of his previous books do, but it, it did get me into a thoughtful place about social discourse and how we treat other human beings. Well, a strong thesis can sometimes be the enemy when a few years later they find out it's been completely debunked. So there's that. But. Well, well uh, you're, the, you're really optimistic. Thank you for that. <laughs> no, I was. I love Gladwell. He's a wonderful Tory. But that was one of the things. I remember one of his books that came out. Like, oh, turned out this study, not what we thought it was. And you're like, ah, it was such a good book, you know. But then you're like, ah, it's cool. But he is. He's actually got a like a master class right now too on writing, which he again he's controversial in some in certainly some sectors. But like, I think is a guy who's really good at, at blending science or psychology and storytelling. He is. He is amazing. Yeah, it seems like much like Elon Musk's number one sin is just tardiness on deliverables. Uh, it seems like Malcolm Gladwell's sin tends to be oversimplification. Uh, that 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 doesn't. I would. Well. There, are, I, uh, there are in some cases. There's taking things that were later debunked, but not wanting to go back or revise that. Or at the time that was he 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 found a narrative, but it was it worked as a narrative. Maybe it wasn't reality. You know, we can get into a bigger discussion about that. But yeah, uh, look. Yeah. Know, the solution is fine, but there's been several issues like his pit bull studies. He's like, no, this is we flat out don't think that's the case anymore. But he's adamant about no, this is the thing, and it's like, all right, he's an amazing writer, and so. And there we go. I think that's that's the Malcolm Gladwell 
point. He's a great synthesizer. He's a great storyteller. He's a great writer. If you really want to get into the stuff, look up more of it. You ask the beautiful thing about the world is that he can be the gateway drug to get you involved in, in a lot of these ideas. Uh, so, uh, my pick, and we'll, we'll stay on the, uh, 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 philosophy train, the new season of the good place, which I'm very, very uh, interested in where it's going because part of what they are dealing with in this season is, uh, dealing with people that you find odious and awful and a, a, a general, uh, a terrible part of the universe. And I'm, I'm curious to see how they are going to wrap up this, the final season. But I think it is uh, something that is very rare in the world of 30 minute comedies, uh, thought provoking and interesting. It's, it's a delightful show and that you, you know, bringing up philosophy, bringing this, we were all, we're up to date on the episodes and it, it really won me over. You guys were talking about it. And I was skeptical. And I'm like, how, how wonderful is it in this day and age that we have a show that gets into the basics of ethics and why we're good or bad to each other and whatnot. And so, I had to, I'm gonna, uh, and also I will I will bring it up I'll bring up this episode since we do have uh, a few um, of authors here on the show, but the the most recent episode in, involves one of the characters writing a putridly terrible book, but then the idea being like, all right, well, everybody's you know very understandably mean to him because he says you know a bunch of uh, awful things in the book, but then he wrote a book. Where do we where do we come down on that? Yeah, and, and because of the stakes set up within the show, I think that there are some interesting conversations uh, of, that not only take place on it, but also come out of it. Cool. Other picks? I'm going to go retro. I just read, oh. for the first time, The Jaws Log, which is a log by the screenwriter of Jaws of the making of the film. And it's been oh, updated. Wow. It was updated 25 years later, so it was, you know updated recently and he you know it's it's really one of the best written like making of film mores i've ever read it really gets into depth on a whole lot of things about filmmaking but just the whole experience of it and decisions that are made and the whole process of adapting a book which of course as an author is fascinating for me and 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 so i i highly recommend it if you're if you like to know kind of about that and you everything from celebrities to behind the scenes of a movie to just the whole process of adapting material to different medium, all of that. And, you know, a lot about the art of collaboration, which is it, more than any other art form, filmmaking is collaborative uh, on, a, on a big, huge level. So I think that um, I highly recommend that. I also, on the subject of film, want to bring up Rashi's film, Dark Passage, which is a little short film that you can find on Andrew's Twitter, but I really, I was really impressed with the, her ability to tell a story in a very short amount of time. The thing's only like two or three minutes long, max, and she tells a little three-act horror story that really well. I gotta say, it's not that easy to do that in a sh that short time frame, so uh, if you like, uh, it's simple, but uh, you know, it's got nuance, and um, I would recommend y'all take a look at it. Yeah, that, no, and that's and that's and that's overstating the runtime. That, that it is it is a one minute horror film. And well, it is, is it only one minute? Okay, I couldn't remember. I was being generous, but you know, yeah. Yeah. It's all the more impressive because yeah. it's only one minute. There you go. Yeah. Well, thank you. Yeah, uh, we'll put up a link in the notes for a week. But you look up Dark Passage and then Rush Batia. Is that? Uh, she says thank you by the way. So, um, but yeah, thank you for the plug on that. Uh, Bryce, do you have a pick? Uh yeah I, I got a I got a quick pick uh they they got the new Apple TV Plus out now anybody's watching oh, any of those oh yeah mm -hmm. um I don't love this but I think the morning show is is pretty good I think it's doing <laughs> it's, pretty good question mark Apple put Plus that on the poster thing, like <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So you paid for Apple TV Plus. Is it's worth the money? Is that what you're saying? No, no it's free a... to everybody. If anybody buys any major Apple anything, everybody gets. Uh, if you're the kind of right. person who upgrades your iPhone every cycle, congrats, you have Apple TV Plus forever. You get a you get a year of Apple TV Plus when you buy most Apple hardware. So it. it... Oh well, I guess I have it then on my iPad that I'm using right now. But I mm -hmm. I looked the other day and it sounded like certain shows were going to be subscription only. So I figured I didn't have. That. No, well, no, no. It's, it's weird all, because it's all. Yeah. Well, because it's it's in the Apple TV app, and so you have the Apple uh, TV Plus shows alongside 
all the stuff that's normally in the TV app, like what you're watching on Hulu and HBO. Um, I think I think the morning show is all right. It's a uh, it's about a morning show, like a Today <laughs> style show, uh, where one of the the lead anchors, Steve Carell. Uh, gets uh, gets me too basically and is is fired from the show and so it follows uh, Jennifer Aniston as she is sort of fighting for control over who who she works with uh, and Reese Witherspoon who is a uh, uh, kind of a, a, a feist, no, feisty feisty is not the right word she's feisty gal she's she, yeah she's she's a she, she was working at a local news station and then ends up getting on the show to talk about this viral clip and then ends up on the show. And so she's kind of navigating the waters of also being now being a, an anchor and having to read what's given to her and not having a lot of pr producing and journalistic yeah. elements to it. So I, I think it's interesting. It's very much like trying to be an Aaron Sorkin thing. I mean, they, there yeah. are walk and talks constantly. There are l l tons of them. A lot of the big, like, was monologuing dramatic speeches um but it doesn't it it doesn't feel as hokey as some of that this, like the do we, do we, do we find out how important the morning news is uh, no i think the world deserves to know is this the most adorable poodle so yeah it, that's who something is <laughs> the fastest eater on the planet how is the scene where when the, the the smart the smart young female protagonist tells the older wise guy, you know, what he gets wrong in life and what he needs to be doing right to set himself straight. You know. Okay. So, so there is a little bit of. But, but, <laughs> but, but I think what's interesting is who. It's Sorkin yeah, without the Sorkin. But but I, I think it's kind of interesting that the the balance of it is because like with the newsroom, right? It's like from episode one, it's like we're gonna do the news right. We have decided we're gonna go back to history and we're gonna cover everything right. Uh, where this is like. They know it's a morning show. They know that, you know, the the company that that they're a part of, the network that they're a part of, they know that this is in the entertainment division and not necessarily that news is a part of the entertainment division and that and that's what Reese Witherspoon's character seems to want to do is to inject more I don't know, hard hitting you know, real heart of of journalism. Yeah. The the Apple TV shows have had, we could describe, sort of a lukewarm reception. But I think that anytime you launch a new platform, God knows what it's like to be producers and writers and stuff working with hardware manufacturers and trying to figure out what your your, your content line is going to be. I'm very hopeful that over time it's probably going to evolve into just you know a, a lot of first-rate entertainment. So yeah, I, you know. I um I, I watched the first episode of For All Mankind. I didn't pick that as my pick today. Um, I watched about... <laughs> I watched that. I watched that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, watched I watched like that. 20 minutes of C this morning. That's that's okay. I thought that they have a, the first of like the Oprah's book club thing on Apple TV Plus. That seemed interesting, though. They make a very big point to talk about. Oh, we're in the uh, uh, I don't know the name of the library, but this this historic library here in Washington D.C. that Apple renovated and is now a big Apple store. And you see the photos of the Apple store next to the historic photos, and it's it seems like a yeah. cool way to do that book club, but. Everyone's got phones in these series. Everyone's got the iPhone. And they know how to yeah. use it, too. In a world where Android doesn't exist. <laughs> yeah. I'm, shocked. I'm shocked at that meta information yeah. that that happened. I can't believe it. Well, it, it, it just the obviousness is, I think, what really people were, you know, kind of that that it's been a thing to point out. But so. Well, yeah. I mean, I got to be honest with you. The way that streaming's divided up between Warner Brothers and Paramount and everybody doing their own thing, we're just going to see more of that. A little yeah. more... The, 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 the whole product placement thing originally, you know, I remember back in the days when in the 70s and 80s when, you know, they avoided it. And now they sell placement on, on movies and TV shows. And when the when the providers control it, you know, it's only going to get worse. I mean, you know, the only the only thing that exists is on Warner Brothers channel is something that Time Warner owns. I mean, that's just the way it's going to be. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, like I was uh, even even Netflix does it. I was watching the Raising Dion show about the little kid who gets superpowers. That show's all right, um, and like the weird like Uncle Godfather guy, his ringtone is the Stranger Things like theme song. So you just hear and it's like, oh my phone, and I'm like, oh my god, it's <laughs> cheaper for them to get the rights to that. Yeah. Um, uh, my pick is Simon Says. 
by Mr. Brian Thomas Schmidt. Listen, if you like sci-fi, you like hard sci-fi, you like thrillers, you like this, I highly recommend you check out, you know, you know, you know, Brian's work and others too. Brian's been a fantastic editor. Brian's had a hands a lot of things, and very good. And now, hey, he's got a new book out, Simon says, the Simon John Simon thriller. So that's my pick available on Amazon. Thank you. I was really hopeful that your your hat was not a commentary on my book. No, I'm wearing my boring company hat. I'm books, seeing but... boring on there, and I'm thinking, oh god, who's, <laughs> who's criticizing? What, what's the what's the subtext here? Hey, uh, I live in a very big glass house, Brian. So, um, oh, well, it's uh, actually okay. a small glass house, but I live in a glass house. It's very fragile glass. So, uh, yes, uh, so. yes, I remember. I've been there. So, yeah, I'm I'm glad you uh, glad to see you getting out there, and I hope you're going to keep doing this. So, um, gentlemen, it's been weird. Huzzah! Now we do after things. So we'll talk, we'll yeah. do, it's a short, much shorter podcast. We'll talk about like uh, more about advice or creative professionals, etc. So Cool. Yeah. But uh, we're going to give everybody a few minutes if they need to go get a drink, go uh, check on something, check your phone, whatever. Uh, give you guys a few moments here. Uh, <laughs> Somebody asked me, because what about the bad picks? And I'm like, I like to work in this town. <laughs> that's why That's why I thought maybe your, your boring hat was a sub, you know. Oh, no. Andrew's always wearing the, the boring pick, company. You know. uh, that or my SpaceX apparel. hat. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I try. I don't know. I feel like I need to, I need to curtail uh, my, my, my negative thoughts online. I need to be the change I want to see in the world. And uh, Gandhi you know, said but that. it's you know, Gandhi it's said that? yeah, yeah, pretty much. You said that. I tweeted it out. <laughs> I, I, I wrestle with that because I see that some of the strongest personalities are often people who have very clearly stake out their point of view on stuff, things like this. And there's a difference between saying I didn't like this, whatever, and being like going on a hate tirade. And that's a thing that I know that, like, I'm a I write books, I create stuff for people, and like, I'm I don't might like, you know, I had I had a friend that made a video that was uh, very persuasive, very powerful sort of video. And it was about kind of like, you know, the 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 homeless situation in L.A. And it kind of did, did a lot to talk about how it, much of it is a drug issue, whatever. But it's a very politicized point of view. And and he made it anonymously. And he's like, oh, we put this out on Twitter. And I'm like, you made this video anonymously because you work in this town and you want me to put this out on my Twitter yeah. feed. That's not what I wish it <laughs> well, that sounds like a bad person. That that person sounds like he did something bad. No, I'm no, you know, no. I mean, it's I it's want, not. He wants Andrew to take the risk that he's not willing to say. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. In, in this, in this saying. In, I agree in, with you. I agree with the premise. Yeah. Yeah. So I, you know, he got it. He was, but I'm like, he's like, oh, would you write? I'm like, <laughs> no. no. I mean, there is a way to do it. If 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 enough people were talking about it, once they could say. Dude, I stumbled across this thing. This is, what do you people think of this without no. actually endorsing it? You know, you don't spend much time on Twitter, do you, sir? <laughs> I, I'm talking about. I I don't spend hardly any time on Twitter. I hate Twitter. Twitter is a cesspool. Yeah, I'm, you can't even like. You know, this photo. You are looking this direction, and does this mean? <laughs> and it's like, no, that's silly. Oh, so now I'm silly. I'm like, ah. <laughs> yeah. Twitter used to I... be my main social media, and I loved it, and I did a live chat every week for like four and a half years. And I, I loved it, but it became after a bunch of people decided to do the whole, uh, you know, uh, attack me thing and pile on and pile on twice in a row in two years. I was like, you know what? I've, I've got better things to do with my time. This is negative energy. I don't need in my life. So I go on there occasionally a few times a week, but I don't spend any time dwelling on them. Yeah. I jumped into at replies on Friday. Um, and uh, I pointed out that uh, based on, you know, Beto O'Rourke had dropped out of the presidential race. I cover politics. Uh, and I was I, I was curious. So I wound up doing the numbers of how much per day various different campaigns that didn't go the distance spent. So how much did they raise compared to how much they spent if you averaged it out per day? Mm. And I found... Uh, that the biggest number that I, at least in my limited searching within the hour and a half afterward that I could find was that of Jeb Bush's campaign in 2016. 
uh, and I made that point in response to uh, a friend of ours quote tweeting the campaign head of the Jeb Bush campaign who was calling for civility. And uh, and then I wound up getting yelled at by the head of the Jeb Bush 2016 campaign. And so and I had very conflicted feelings because on one hand, it's like I wasn't saying anything that was untrue. Uh, but on, and I pointed out something that he had kind of taken a shortcut on, but it didn't make me feel great. I didn't feel fantastic about like, ah, got him. You got to You know, th that's the danger. Like I once criticized the celebrity who was bragging about going drunk into Burger King and being rude to people. And I was like, you're proud. And you're proud of that. That's all I said. I got hate mail tweets from his fans for a week to follow, like constantly 24 hours a day. Like, yeah. what an ass you are to say that to him. I'm like, well, the guy's talking about being a dick. I'm sorry. I'm just curious. You know? Yeah, I mean, that's that's the thing. Is I, uh, I don't know. Uh, it's, uh, I think that there's, there's a room for this kind of discussion. I don't know if I did it in particularly the right way. But then again, that's what I get for jumping into Jack Allison's uh, I, app. I don't know. I just think that people on Twitter... It used to be a community. We used to get on there, and we it was like hanging out with old friends all the time. We had a great time, but now it's become so much more about people looking to tear down people that 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 represent something they dislike, or that you know are in a position of power that they resent or whatever, or politically on their own. You know, there's just it's so there's just so much of constantly people trying to tear people down that you know. I, I'd rather go in a, at a different environment. I enjoy Instagram a lot. I don't see a lot of that going on, on Instagram. It may be going on. Maybe I'm following the right people, so I don't see it. But you know, I mean, I enjoy Instagram. I enjoy uh, I enjoy my Facebook. I'm very careful who I follow, and I don't, uh, you know, I, I I don't hesitate to unfollow or or limit people on my personal Facebook. And certainly, um, I have disinvited people from my professional page too a couple of times who were, you know, looking for problems. So I, you know, I just think. It's just not something I deal. It's just it's not the negativity really gets to me in a way that maybe it doesn't to other people. So I protect myself to the degree I can. All right. You ready so, to roll? Yes. All right, guys. When you have to think, well, yeah, dude. Let's fix some. Dick, let's right? fix right. some right. creatives' lives. Okay. All right. Let's, oh wait. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, whenever you're ready, Andrew, take it away. Hello, and welcome to After Things. I'm Andrew Main, joined by Justin Robert Young. Oh, hello. Brian Brushwood. Yo, yo, yo. Bryce Castillo. Hey, everybody. That's me. And our special guest, Brian Thomas Schmidt. <laughs> what it is. So uh, for those of you who listen to weird things I haven't listened before, uh, Brian is a, uh, a very uh, highly recognized science fiction author, editor, etc. He was an editor on The Martian by Andy Weir. And if you heard about that book, if you haven't, I'm sorry. Uh, Brian uh, more recently was the uh, editor and assembled the anthology, anthology of the Predator Anthology, If It Bleeds, which I got to have a story in there. And now he's got a brand new book out called Simon Says. It's a John Simon thriller. And I'm going to give you a quote from Mr. Jonathan Mayberry, no less. Simon Says is packed with action, snarky humor, action, great characters, and even more action. A dynamic read cover to cover. But does it have an action? Mm, a question that you can only answer if you buy it. You'll yeah. have to read it to find out. Yeah. So, Brian, you you have uh, you've been involved in publishing for a number of years in both writing, editing, et cetera. And we have a lot of a lot of people who on this listen to us, whatever, talk to us. Some of our aspirational writers, so many people want to do that. And let's give a hypothetical case. Let's say somebody's finished a book and they want to know what to do with the book now. What do you do in 2019, 2020? What what? What is the publishing landscape like? How do you take something from somebody's manuscript to a finished product? Because you've done it in both published, self-published, all the different areas. What's your suggestion or pathway? Well, what, you're saying they've got the manuscript. It's done. They're ready to submit it. What path should they take? Mm -hmm. Because, I mean, that's a broad question. It, what resources do they have? You have two minutes to answer it. Go. What, re what resources do you have? Do you know somebody in publishing who can get you in touch with? People, are you really good at going out and finding email addresses, which I am, online? A minute and 45 seconds. If not, 
do you have the resources and ability to get a book self-published and put it out in a way that's a quality that, that will not embarrass you? Because it's seriously important to put out a quality product because, you know, people may, may never look at your name again if you don't. All of those kind of things. Do, you know, can you afford an editor? Uh, all of those kind of things. Then you need to make decisions about, you know, and tracking those people down is really easy to do. You just have to ask other people who they use and who they know and, and you'll go from there. And I think, uh, you know, there's any number of valid paths, as Andrew said. And uh, I think your main thing is how much are you willing to put into it yourself? How much do you want to rely on other people? What is the path that you're most comfortable with? That's the real that, choice. I, All right. I, I think out of everything you just mentioned, the one that, that piqued my interest immediately is a version of the question, who do you know that knows? You know, that six degrees of separation thing, you truly are no more than six introductions away from anyone who is a gatekeeper to to get you in front of whatever your project uh, on a bigger platform let, let me let me give you an example and this is pretty cool this just happened to me i wrote a screenplay in march it's something i've been thinking of for a long time it's about a, a little person artist who is getting evicted and he falls back on his teaching degree to make money and survive and ends up in an inner city school with troubled kids and he ends up teaching art and turning their lives and his own life around and it's called the art teacher I wrote it with Peter Dinklage in mind. It was inspired by, in part, my relationship with some real little people and seeing the station agent, among other things. It's now sitting in Peter Dinklage's hands. He's reading it this weekend, all right? From March, all right? I don't know Peter Dinklage. I've never met him before, but I knew enough people that people were able to get it in his hands in less than, you know, in six months. That is more, that's one advantage of all the stuff we've been talking about today about the technology and you know the internet and all that you're in a community and that community is very large and somebody you know can get it to the right people however you need to do the due diligence to make sure that what you're giving them is something that they're going to want to see that's the tricky part you get it you, you, you know if you if you establish yourself if people are like wow i got something from andrew Mann and that was total crap they're not going to want to see anything from Andrew Mann again. I mean there's a possibility I, i'm using Andrew as an example but his stuff is not crap but i'm just saying that because all he does is is just like use a magic spell and turn it into genius and so he's you know like a god so unfortunately you know he's not normal like the rest of us but my point is joking aside you've got to make sure that what you're putting out there is worth putting out there to the degree that you're going to get noticed and that means you got to decide you know you've got to, if you don't know who an editor is to help you ask around use your network to find somebody if you don't know artists that can do a good cover for you, if you can't do book layout, same process. That's what I mean. You, chances are, whether you know it or not, you know somebody who can help you find somebody. So you. So, should. let's let's imagine like a hypothetical. You know, my name is uh, uh, Mandrew Ain, and I don't know anybody in publishing. I've been writing kind of for as a hobby for a number of years. I'm not in. I'm not in this podcasting. I'm not in this Twitter thing. I don't know another writer. I don't know a thing. What would be a good starting point? Would you say like I, I knew I knew people who got writing deals after going to some of these smaller science fiction write you know fantasy conventions and meeting publishers and editors? Not the first day they went, not the first time they went, but after a couple of years developing relationships with people, is that maybe a good you know use of time is to say start going here's, to convention? Here's the simple long and short of it: everything that involves entertainment of any form, whether it's acting, directing, writing whatever whether it's books screenplays whatever networking is what's going to get you there now networking can take many forms in this day and age but the more you can put yourself in the right spot to have the opportunity to meet people who can help you the better success you're going to have so basically if you want to go to some of these little writing workshops and stuff that's an opportunity make sure you do the due diligence to find out it's one that is actually legit where there's good quality and has a good rep and, and maybe even some People who are connected better than you are going to attend it. You don't want to just go to Joe Blow writing conference thrown by some guy who's never, you know, I mean, there's a lot of people who put stuff out there that really you're not going to, it's not going to help you at all. You got to make sure that you're picking the right one. If you want to go and go on Twitter and write to your favorite author and say, here's what I'm doing. Could you point me in any direction of how to find somebody to help me with editing or whatever? You'll be surprised how many people will help you. So one of the things, 
one of the things you've done, which I think is really cool, is you've done you did the you've done the Predator anthology, if it bleeds, where you assembled different writers who got a write in the universe of Predator. I think did you do that with Alien too? No, or, no, Jonathan uh, Mayberry did that. So what other? But you so you've done I think you've done some other anthologies, those I two did like that. X Files, but I was one of the writers on an X Files anthology. All right. So what's like with so when you did you know Predator if it bleeds, you you were able to bring people in. You know what was. Uh, what did you look for stories? What was the guidance? I assume you had input from Fox or the rights holders. How did that work? Well, Fox dealt with Titan. Uh, everything ran through Fox. Fox had to sign off. It's the same process that we had when we did the Jonathan Maber Joe Ledger anthology in his literary universe and Monster Hunter uh, files in Larry Korea's uh, universe. We we had you know the the people who are the intellectual property owners get to sign off on everything we do. They signed off at a, at a pitch stage, and then they signed off in the final and made appropriate changes and asked for whatever changes needed to be made to make it, you know, as close to being canon as possible. And all these projects we're talking about here, X-Files, Predator, Monster Hunter, Joe Ledger, they all went through that same process. It takes various forms. Um, Titan, in the case of Predator, sent my Predator manuscript over to Fox, and Fox people signed off on it. Oh, and then okay. told us what told us what we needed to fix, what we didn't need to fix, so on and so forth. I actually think, you know, they're not, and I don't, far be it for me to criticize Fox, but Fox is such a big organization. We actually probably got less feedback in that regard from Fox than we probably, I wish we'd had a little more. Um, but with, you know, Joe Ledger, with the authors we dealt with on the Monster Hunter Joe Ledger, we got a lot more direct feedback about those kind of things. And it, was, it, it varies. Different author stories. I did... I read everything Predator out there that I could find. Every novel, every graphic novel, every comic book I could find. I read almost everything that exists and watched all the movies. So I did a lot of that work before the stories even went to Fox. Not didn't always happen. Certain anthologies that I know of you know, along this line, there was a lot more feedback from Fox because they didn't have somebody who was acting as gatekeeper that way. So that's helpful that you knew that. So let me ask a, a, a self-publishing question. I have a manuscript, let's say, and I want to go out there. So you know what? I'm going to go self-publish it. You know, uh, how do you how do you find editors? How do you find people like this to help you with this? Well, you know, I've got my editing links out on my website. I've got the blurbs and how to get a hold of me and what my rates are and all that. And there's lots of people like me. The number one way, you, the number th one thing is you need to make sure that I know what I'm doing. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um. In my case, you probably guess I can because I've got credits like The Martian and from Alan Dean Foster and Frank Herbert books and other books that I've edited. Plus, I've got all these books that are published anthologies by major publishers. So you can probably assume I know something about what I'm doing. But there's a lot of people, anybody could put their editing shingle out and they don't necessarily have any good credits. But so the number one thing you need to do is you need to not only find somebody who, who knows about them or has used them, look at their client list. If they're not willing to publish their client list or give you the names of clients as references, then you want to walk away because it's the number one sign that they're, you know, they 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 could be problematic. I don't have any problem listing my clients out there. Go out and ask my clients about me. I no problem. Go ahead. You know, I want you to know that I'm the right fit for you. Ask them how I work. Ask them my approach to editing. What's my style? Ask for a free sample. Say I want you to do a sample ten page edit and show me your process so I know whether it feels right to me. I always do that for people. It's it's I want to I want it to be a good fit, too, because I want to have a good experience. I've had plenty of bad ones. So like on your page, you talk about you offer your editing services to do this sort of stuff. And you, and you talk what it costs per hour. Now, I would have no idea if like if I said, oh, I had a hundred thousand word book and I wanted copy edits. How would I figure out like pricing on that or what that would you know cost? Well, it, the thing and I probably need to you're right. I probably need to up, up, update that a little bit. But the reality of it is, is I basically can do between 3,500 and 4,500 words an hour, and it depends on the quality of the manuscript, all right? Okay. So I have to do an assessment, and then when I look at your, I will always ask for for sample chapters. I want some from the beginning, some from the middle, and some from the end, because quite frankly, my experience is the, it, the beginnings of novels are always more polished than later later parts of it, because people have spent more time working on their beginnings. So I may look at something and think this is a really clean, really good edit, and then I get into it and it's like, oh my god, you know, that's happened to me more times than I can count. So I need to get a sense of how much work is it going to be, and then I will give them an estimate along the scale of between 3,500 to 4,500 words an hour. What do I think? And then against those hourly rates, and I'll always okay. tell them, you know, this is what it is. 
I but, know I know an author with an extensive back catalog that's looking to have maybe one or two of his books copy edited, and he may be reaching out to you shortly after the podcast. Okay. I mean, I you know I'm always happy to do it. Honestly, if they're the further along they are, copy editing. Um, it's it's depending on what type of copy editing I'm doing is generally faster than, you know, line edits and developmental mm-hmm. edits where I have to do multiple passes and think about multiple levels too. So well, let, 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 could you could you explain for listeners like the difference between a developmental edit and a copy edit? Just just you know the brief okay. sort of Twitter the, summary. The, the developmental edit is where you're talking about story and characters and structure and overall storytelling. Stru- you know things on a a level of the structure when you're getting into copy editing you're actually dealing with the the or line editing and copy editing line editing is actually when i'm actually going through and line by line editing for grammar and repetitive words and character names and anything and everything and you know are you using too many sentences that are exactly the same they all start with because 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 Mm -hmm. or they're all compound (coughs) excuse me um do you have a mix of the of the types of sentences How's your pace? Those kind of things. When it comes to copy editing, I'm getting more into something that's probably been through line editing and developmental editing, hopefully. And I'm just cleaning it up. And I'm looking. And if if you hire me to do fact checking, which I hope you don't, because that's not my favorite part of the copy editing process, I will also be doing fact checking to find out, did you make this crap up or did you actually check your facts? Do you have errors that need to be fixed? Do you have citations that need to be put in? All this kind of stuff. Is it is it current? Are you dated? You know, is yeah, that was a fact ten years ago, but unfortunately, it's not anymore. They've, they've debunked it. Mm-hmm. You look like an idiot. You need to fix that. You know what I mean? You want yeah. somebody to do that for you. Believe me, you do. But yeah. it's 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 another part of the copy editing process as well. There's also things like <clears throat> some copy editors. I don't do this because it's not my my training, um, but some of the copy editors that, the, in New York who probably are far more professional copy editors and strictly copy editors as opposed to all the things I do, will actually give you a word count exactly how many times every word is used in your book, which I find unbelievable to me that they can actually do that. I don't know how much time they spend counting that, but they actually can tell you, you know, how many times you use specific words. They'll actually make a list like you could use for a glossary of all things, all that stuff. So it, it, they're they're kind of it's more much more technical copy editing than line editing and um, developmental editing is not technical at all. It's really more about craft. Mm-hmm. Mm. Um, any proofing, any resource? Proofing, by the way, proofing is not copy editing. And proofing are not the same thing. Proofing is where you go through and look for anything that everybody else missed. Yeah. The several stages. It takes a lot, and I, I sometimes skip those stages, which you know I would regret. Any any resources or things like this you'd recommend for people to check out? Any favorite books or stuff on the topic of writing? Or well, I do have a writing called a book called How to Write a Novel, where I cover all this stuff, and I think it's actually pretty helpful. My blog has write tips, and if you look on blog, there's a drop down menu for just the write tips post, <clears throat> where I cover a lot of these kind of craft, and I'm slowly putting. Bits in bits and pieces, the entire book, how to write a novel, on there. Also, oh yeah, yes. Yeah, so your book boot camp on my website, which is ten minute, ten to fifteen minute videos that talk about various oh, elements of craft, right out of that book, that actually will be helpful to you. On top of that, um, I published on my blog a list of, and published in how to write a novel, a list of the great writing books that I admire. But I would say, the elements of fiction series by Writers Digest, some of which are no longer like actively being printed, but you can track them down used very easily on Amazon or in bookstores. The Elements of Fiction Writing are is a great series. They have books on plot, dialogue, description, setting, so on and so forth. Very helpful stuff. Very good stuff. Um, Stephen King's On Writing is a book that every writer ought to read. And um, there's a book, what is it called? Um, <clears throat> on Writing Well. Actually, I can't remember the name of the author. I always forget, but it is a classic, and it's more focused on nonfiction. But everything he says applies to fiction too. It's it's mm. an amazing book. 
So um, your book, uh, How to Write a Novel, by the way, for everybody, it's 99 cents on Amazon. Look up Brian Thomas Schmidt. It's 99 cents. It's a great way to start from there, and I think you can get a, a, you know, a good take on that. Uh, you know, and I, oh, you have a quote from Mr. Scott Sigler, who's a friend of all of ours. So, yeah, um, Mr. Sigler was very kind. So there you go. There's two. There's there's that one, and there's the one that's actually on the cover of the book too. That's different. So. Cool. Uh, we guys wanted. To, so my pick is how to write a novel: the fundamentals of fiction by Mr. Brian Thomas Schmidt, as well as take a look at his other books in his uh, on the topic of that. Go to Brian's website, check it out. If you're looking for somebody who is, you know, if he's if he's good enough to edit Andy Weir, I think he could probably handle, you know. <laughs> Yeah, somebody else. So you know, I'll, I'll other- double down on on writing. That was that was a fantastic read, uh, just about the craft, and and I think that uh, uh, Stephen King gives his take in a very approachable way. I liked it a lot. Yeah, yeah the first half of the book is really his autobiography. The second half of the book, he actually talks about craft and he gives examples, and it's it's um, very insightful. It's very yeah. Uh... Uh, my pick is an Associated Press story out today uh, entitled Fake News, No Jobs, Prospective Journalist Soldier On, in which uh, my former uh, a place of, of work and uh, a place I've talked about a lot, uh, The Daily Orange, is chronicled. So uh, if you scroll down, Bryce, a little bit, you can see uh, a, a shot from – that's from – the main image is from The Daily Tar Heel. But uh, down a little bit, uh, that is the – uh, or the next, eh, maybe it's not there on ABC anyway. Uh, but there's, uh, uh, it's great. It's a great thing that goes into, uh, uh, just where journalism is on, uh, college campuses and, uh, the kind of stuff that people have to go through to keep that business alive, which is fully independent. And if, uh, you would like to donate, donate.dailyorange.com because they're about to have their house bulldozed in 10 days by a private university so they can build more dorms and continue to uh, perpetuate the student debt complex. <laughs> if we are doing picks, I will give you a pick. It's the Emotion Thesaurus, the Writer's Guide to Character Expression. This is by Angela Ackerman and Becca Pugliosi. You can see how beat up this is because this is the only writing craft book I carry with me everywhere when I'm writing. Uh, this I have it on ebook too, but I don't like to flip back and forth away from my manuscript, so I just carry this book. This will tell you <clears throat> if a person is hopeful or angry, what are the physical signs, what are the internal sensations, what are the mental responses, what are the acute signs? All these things that help you write sensory, the five senses much better and actually create a visceral landscape for your book. Very cool. <coughs> Anybody else? Bryce? N- uh, n- no, no after pick, uh, after things pick for me this week. Uh, All right. Yeah. Punt. Uh, Thank you very much, guys, for joining us. Brian, thank you very much, you know, for uh, being here. And uh, we'll see you all on the Internet (laughs) next time. Ah, that's our catch, please. (laughs) It's been been a part of Twitter. Oh, wait, no. It's been after. (laughs) And scene. (laughs) Andrew, can you make a a Twitter-proof shark suit? A it's Twitter called shirt? Don't Open Twitter. Yeah. <laughs> Next week. Delete Twitter Never. off your phone. <laughs> yeah. Uh, hey, I, I got to go right. pick up my kid, but Brian, it was it was a joy to get to, to hang out with you a bit. Uh, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, Brian. Yeah, yeah we're Appreciate about to, uh, we're going to close it down for the day. I, I thank you everybody for, uh, for watching us here live. Or, uh, make sure you check out weirdthings.com. Make sure you subscribe and download uh, here on the channel. Make sure you turn on the notifications. I just found out a thing. About 15% of our people have notifications turned on here on Twitch. Hey, right on. Let's, that's great. Let's get it even, <coughs> even, even more. Those are rookie numbers. We got to right. get those numbers up. That's right. Uh, so hit the bell, like, comment, and subscribe. All the yeah, stuff fam. that everyone hates. Uh, we'll be back with Cord Killers here in, uh, in just a few hours. Uh, keep an eye out on everyone's social medias for other stuff that they're doing. Hope you guys have a good rest of your Monday. Bye-bye. Peace out. Ourselves. Yeah.